respiratory infections. Now, how do people with respiratory infections typically present? Uh, the big thing to always pay attention to are the vital signs, and specifically any kind of infectious process, you want to pay attention to their temperature. Certainly for a respiratory process, you want to pay attention to their respiratory rate, and very often the heart rate also is a sign of the body under stress. So elevated heart rate is also going to be indicating that something is going on over here. Now, as soon as you start thinking about a respiratory infection, you should always be thinking that step one is going to ask you either what the diagnosis or what the treatment is. Now, for the treatment for respiratory infection, it's almost always going to require antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection. So let's proceed and talk a little bit about that. I've included a slide that shows two chest x-rays, one for typical and one for atypical pneumonia. Now, let's talk a little bit about what, what it is that we're talking about. For a typical pneumonia, the picture is somebody who is old and very, very sick. So this person is like 68 years old, and they've had this horrendous, horrendous fever and cough, and they've just been completely debilitated, and they've been, you know, just in bed for the last couple of days until they came to see you. You get this chest x-ray, and you see this characteristic lobar infiltrate over here. It's in the right lower lobe. And you can actually make out the fissure line, which is kind of nice because you can appreciate the anatomy of the lungs over there in this chest x-ray. This is the picture of a typical pneumonia. And the bugs that we like to think about typically are strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, and Staph aureus. These are the big bugs that cause typical pneumonia. On the other hand, when we think about an atypical pneumonia, we get a slightly different picture. The person is usually younger, they're generally healthy, and they're not as sick. So for example, you see a 24-year-old man, he comes into you for a persistent cough and low grade fever, but he still has been able to go to work, although he's been feeling pretty lousy, and he says, Doc, you got to do something for me. Maybe I need a Z-Pack. People like the word ZPAC because, you know, they've had it before and then it makes them feel better. So you get a chest x-ray and then you see the chest image that we have over here on the right side of the screen, which has a patchy kind of infiltrate. And it's a little hard to see, but in the left lung field of, at around the cardiac silhouette, there is a circle around a, a hazy area. And it's not a very impressive chest x-ray compared to the one with typical pneumonia, which really, really jumps out at you, that low bar infiltrate. But this is very typical for atypical pneumonia. I know it's weird to say typical and atypical over and over and over again, but in spite of the wordplay, we do have to know what kind of bugs that we're going to be worried about. So the bugs that cause atypical pneumonia very often on the step one are going to be mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, and legionella pneumophila. As you recall from the last lecture, there are a couple of key features that we had to remember. Mycoplasma does not have a cell wall and it also contains sterols in its membrane. Chlamydia also is an endocellular it's parasitic in that it lives in our cells, and Legionella has got bizarre culture requirements. So very important things to know about pneumonia infections. Also, immunocompromised people tend to also get infected with Pseudomonas, and it's important to remember that people who are immunocompromised are usually HIV positive, or they have in the history some kind of recent organ transplantation, be it liver, heart, or kidney, because then they're going to be on immunosuppressants. So again, for the step one, Always remember how to recognize somebody who's immunocompromised because that's going to change what you're looking at in terms of the question. Let's talk about some other kinds of respiratory infections. Moving higher in the respiratory tree, let's talk a little bit about pharyngitis. So the main types of pharyngitis that the step one is going to ask you to know a little bit about, there's the regular strep throat, which is caused by strep pyogenes, and this person has got some scratchy you know, throat pain, low-grade fever, lymphadenopathy, usually just on one side, but can also be two sides. They're usually not coughing. They're sick, but they're not horrendously ill. So you think of strep pyogenes, and we do give antibiotics because you do not want that to progress to rheumatic fever and, you know, uh, rheumatic heart disease. The other kind of pharyngitis that you should know is the picture of a kid who comes in. They're really, really, really sick. Really, really, really sick. The parents are really worried. Their throat is all swollen. And you're going to get something in the history for example, that they are an immigrant and they're not immunized, or it will say their immunization history is not well known. And by the way, for the purposes of the step one, if you are told that the immunization history is not known, just consider them to be unimmunized. Or they'll say something in the history about how they're big fans of Jenny McCarthy and they don't believe in immunizations. And when you see this constellation of things, and they may also give you either a picture of a pseudomembrane over the back of the throat, or they'll tell you that they'll just describe the pseudomembrane as a physical exam finding, you need to start thinking of diphtheria. 
And then they'll ask you another couple questions, either a characteristic about the bug, for example, you know, something like what's its gram staining characteristic, or they could also ask you something about the disease process, like, for example, to know that it involves ADP ribosylation of the elongation factor too. One of these types of questions could pop up, or you also ask a question like what should you do in terms of immunization, which would be passive as well as active. Right, so you're going to give them Ig, and you're also going to give them the theory of toxo. So these are the kinds of things that you have to do. So moving on now, we'll talk a little bit about epiglottitis. This is obviously going to be an infection of the epiglottis, and there are going to be a couple of buzzwords with this kind of infection. You'll have a barky kind of cough, or a baby that sounds like a seal. They'll say something like a seal bark, and they may also describe strider, inspiratory strider. And the bugs that we have to think about are Haemophilus influenza and Moraxella catarralis. And these bugs are very important because, again, you know, in kids you have to worry about their immunization status because nowadays we do immunize against Haemophilus influenza. The last piece of respiratory infection we're going to talk about is sinusitis. And sinusitis almost always occurs after a cold. Usually it's from a viral illness just because it causes some irritation of the tracts that drain the sinuses, which allow the bacteria to grow in these stagnating pools of secretions in the sinuses. And then you get a sinus infection, and the typical presentation is going to be somebody who's been sick for a while, they've had head congestion, maybe some frontal tenderness or maxillary tenderness, and the bugs to think about are, again, strep pneumo, haemophilus influenza, and anaerobes. And the big key to anaerobes is that there's going to be very foul-smelling discharge because anaerobes produce hydrogen sulfide gas. So that's going to be very, very stinky. And that's how you're going to know if you're talking about anaerobes. 